Welcome to Solving the Problem of Hunger, an examination of a Mexico-Indian history of scientific innovation. This lecture is a part of the series of public lectures and discussions organized by Science Gallery Bengaluru for its first digital exhibition, Phytopia. For Phytopia, we hope to bring together engineers, scientists, designers, artists, and biohackers to create an, lab, an experience where visitors can experiment beyond the kitchen, the lab, and the farm. This program is organized in collaboration with the Bangalore International Center. A warm welcome to today's speaker, Gabriela Soto La Viega. She is a professor of the history of science and Antonio Madero professor for the study of Mexico at Harvard University. Her current research interests interrogate knowledge production and circulation between Mexico and India, medical professionals and social movements, and science and development projects in the 20th century. Before we begin, I would like to remind our audience that Gabriela will be present for a question and answer session after this lecture at 7.30 p.m. You may post your questions in the chat box and we will pass them on to her. In the mid-1960s, concerns over population growth and the ability to feed a hungry world dominated global policy. The elimination of hunger via science, specifically agricultural science, was seen as a plausible solution. The global solution came to be known as the Green Revolution, and it was pushed from Mexico, where it originated, across the globe. Gabriela, you've done extensive research about this endeavor, and we are very excited to know what your insights have been. So over to you. Uh, thank you so much. I. I'm really grateful for this lovely invitation from the Science Gallery, Bengaluru, and um, I'm very excited about Phytopia, and um, I will begin now. I will share my screen. So um, I want to draw attention to this particular image. As you will likely hear from uh, often in these proceedings and from other speakers, plants have multiple lives. They feed, they clothe, they nourish, they heal, and give us shelter. Yet they also continue to be the focus of scientific inquiry. Today, I will focus on just one plant, a crop, wheat. There are few crops so often associated with mid-20th century development projects, as is wheat. Hybrid seeds, in particular, hybrid wheat seeds, were built to increase yields alleviate poverty, and bring what was so-called modernity to the rural landscape. They held so much promise. Today, I wish to use wheat not as the point of analysis, but rather to use wheat as an entry point to analyze how we use plants to tell stories about the past. In particular, how we use wheat uh, as the narrative of development of national aspirations for not just one country, but multiple countries. And of course, as a source of scientific innovation. But first, I want to start with this image, which is one of my favorite images. And this is a field located in northern Mexico, but I call it a living library. And it is visible for only a few months out of the year. And what you see here, as far as the eye can see, are specific hybrid types of wheat. And you, as you'll see the first one here, it's a green revolution variety released and grown on millions of hectares in many countries, and it is still grown. Meaning that this is a seed that was developed in the 1960s and has continued to be tweaked. I'm going to return to this image because I want you to look at um, from the first sight, it appears to be an image of diversification, of diversity, of crop diversity, honestly, as far as the eye can see. So I want you to keep that image in your mind because I will come back to it. I also want you to keep this mural on your mind. Um, this was a mural that was painted by Diego Rivera. It has a very interesting story. It was initially painted as Man at the Crossroads and initially painted at the Rockefeller Center in New York. But he refused to take out Lenin, whom you can see on the right side. 
and uh, it was destroyed in 1934 because it could not be at the heart of capitalism, steps from Wall Street in New York, and have this prominent figure of, of Lenin. He repainted it at the Palace of Fine Arts in Mexico City. Now, this is important for a reason that we will, and has a particular link to India that we will see um, later on in this talk. So, um, and finally, this is the other, the third image that I want you to keep as I continue to, to give this talk. This is an image from the 1950s, and you can find in the Rockefeller Archive Center. And it was taken in the mid 1950s. And as you can see, it's a farm family, a Mexican farm family. And the idea is that there, it's farmers who will provide the world with plenty, and not just any type of farmers. These are Mexican farmers. So we normally don't think of farmers as those who are providing plenty or surplus. So the story changed significantly along the way. And it changed not just for how Mexican farmers were going to be seen, but also how, how farmers across the world were going to be portrayed as needing aid to produce the crops, the plants that they needed. And it wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be, uh, they wouldn't be independent. They would have to depend on foreign technology in order to continue to produce the crops that they had traditionally produced themselves. The narrative was going to shift. They would need aid in order to continue to do what they had long been doing. Okay, so to return briefly to this image, that change in narrative has a lot to do with how science perceived what crops could do and what they could produce over time and over space. So this is a story very much about time and space and how scientists were able to play with that when it came to plants and to make them travel across the world and fool plants into thinking that they were still in the same soil in which they had been created. But the, I'm really simplifying that and I'll, I'll get more deeply into that. But first, I, I want to spend about 10 minutes or so giving you a background history of what the Green Revolution is, because this is very much a story of the Green Revolution, but I want us all to be on the same page, have a common background history to then understand um, a bit more of the story that I'm wishing to tell. So if you are to pick up a book uh, about the Green Revolution, most likely this is the story that you will hear. And it's often repeated, so you may have already heard it. But the origins of the Green Revolution are often attributed to, uh, or the roots, to a visit that former Secretary of Agriculture under President Roosevelt to, undertakes in the early 1940s to Mexico. And he decides to travel rural Mexico. And what he finds there, according to many reports, is incredible poverty. But most disturbing for him, he feels, and he comes from a farming background, and he feels that the farmers are not using enough technology or science to produce more crops and that this can be shifted, this can be changed. So I have a bit of problems, as you can probably tell from this narrative. From the beginning, it's a narrative of poor people, poor farmers who need foreign aid. But this is, as I said, the story as it is told. In 1943, um, the Mexican government, together with, the, with funds from the Rockefeller Foundation, so funds from the Mexican government and the Rockefeller Foundation, they come together and they, they create the Office of Special Studies for the Mexican Agricultural Program. And the idea is to produce better crops that will yield more, but also will be more resistant to diseases, and ideally that they can help farmers produce more. Um, more. Also, the arrival of the Rockefeller Foundation in Mexico will change how agriculture is understood or talked about in Mexico. It will no longer be an issue of subsistence agriculture that will fuel Mexico's dreams of urbanization and industrialization, but it will be this notion, but rather an industrialized Mexico, an urban Mexico, a Mexico that's able to export grains. So very, not subtly, the conversation shifts from those peasants those farmers, subsistence farmers, to one of a more commercialized farmer who will be able to bring progress to the nation. This may sound familiar to some of you in India. 
um, but the story also shifts. And you, in, when you're reading the Green Revolution story, very prominent in the foreground are American scientists, American agronomists, and American politicians and diplomats. Um, and this is something that with my Indio, India Mexico project, I'm trying to push them to the background. They're still part of the story and bring Mexican and Indian scientists to the foreground because it was these scientists on the ground who were the ones who were doing much of the work. So it was really important for um, in this map, the Mexican agricultural program to deal with wheat diseases because in particular stem rust, stem rust could affect a field and destroy a farmer's crop um, completely. But also there was a problem with the type of wheat that existed in the mid 20th century, which was a wheat that could be found across the world, both in Mexico and India. And it was this very tall, very lithe, very elegant wheat, but it was tall enough. And when winds came, it could lodge, meaning fall over. So there was a, a very clear dilemma. How do you produce a wheat that is resistant to disease, but one that is also short enough to be resistant to lodging? So this was a puzzle and you needed science, you needed experimentation in order to, to solve this puzzle. And in Mexico, there, were, there was a chain of experimental stations across the country, but there were two experimental stations that become really important um, for the study of wheat and in particular, the ability for wheat to travel across the world. So one was near Mexico City in Chapingo, which was close to the National School of Agriculture. And the other one was in the north, bordering the Sonoran Desert. And um, both of these stations already existed, but with this, with funding from the Rockefeller Foundation, they become very important. Why? Because by the 1940s, the world is divided. It's the Cold War era. And you're going to have a world that, um, as it says here, Communism makes attractive promises to underfed peoples. Democracy must not only promise as much, but must deliver more. Asiatic and other underprivileged people attribute their present plight to the domination of the capitalist colonial system. In this struggle for the minds of, the men, of men, the side that best helps satisfy man's primary needs for food, clothing, and shelter is likely to win. This is a report, an internal report from the Rockefeller Foundation and what we see here is that um, the, the world is being conceived as capitalism will triumph if it can feed the world. So whichever superpower gets there first, so feeding the world now is really wrapped up into this Cold War narrative. And this is where, again, Mexico's experimental stations will play a really important part. How do you feed the world if you need to produce more? Well, uh, agronomist Norman Borlaug comes up with this idea. And he says, it takes about eight years, about eight cycles of wheat for uh, a trait to become part of the seed. What if we use Mexico's extraordinary microclimates? It has jungles, it has deserts, it has um, tropical forests. What if we use those and literally truck the seeds back and forth? From the north where you have Ciudad Obregón, with its climate that is very similar to the Punjab, then we can take it to Mexico City and in particular to Toluca, which in some, way, in some ways resembles some areas of Tamil Nadu. So we can have these, these microclimates and work them to our advantage because we would plant two harvests, we would harvest crops of wheat in one year. And instead of eight year wait, we would reduce that to four. So this shuttle breeding becomes incredibly important um, and successful. So, so successful in fact, that in a matter of just a few years, the wheats that are being produced in these experimental stations are drawing the attention of not just American politicians, but Mexican politicians and also investors. Here's a picture of Vice President Henry Wallace with, the Me with Mexico's Minister of Agriculture and a former Mexican president. And what's being shown here is the extraordinary wheat that is being produced in these stations. Do you notice how low it is? 
it's a dwarf wheat. You no longer have these tall, elegant stalks that could tip over, but rather they have developed these dwarf seeds, the, uh, these dwarf wheats, which are closer to the ground, but yield more grain. So you can see here the difference. The tall wheats in um, my left side, and then as you're going down to the different type of high yielding hybrid wheat seeds. So the idea was to produce a series of varieties that are capable of out yielding local varieties from Chile to Canada, from Minnesota to the Near East. Really important. Standardization. Create one variety that will be able, that will basically carpet the world because these varieties will be able to out yield local varieties. This is really important, and I'm sure you will hear from other speakers about the loss of many um, crops and plants and flowers and that from, from local regions, which your grandmothers may remember, and which you may see images of which no longer exist. So here is the process, the beginning of this idea of standardization is good. This is the idea in the mid 20th century. We now see the complications in the 21st century of trying to out yield local varieties. But here, remember, the push is, is multifold. Number one, to spread capitalism as opposed to a, a Soviet style socialism, and um, also to feed the world, which is a huge concern. This is um, the uh, an image that was in Life magazine from the Bengal famine. Again, this image that um, so many of us are accustomed to where you see the malnourished, starving child. And the idea with these images was to say there are some areas of the world that need aid, that need food aid. Do you see how this narrative is being formed? We can provide the food. And who better to provide food in the mid 20th century than Mexico, which has been producing so much of this hybrid seed. So what you have in the, um, in the early 1960s, a massive famine is hitting both Pakistan and India. And the predictions are that as many as 17 million people could potentially die if they don't receive food um, or if they don't receive aid um, of, of some kind. So the Rockefeller Foundation, which by that time has been in Mexico for over 20 years and has been experimenting for a while, and um, the farmers around these experimental stations have produced so much wheat that Mexico is now exporting wheat to the world. So they decide to bring these hybrid seeds and make the largest shipment. I'm just going to go back one image so you can see this is the hull of the ships that are leaving the Mexican ports and they are headed to what was then called Bombay. And you have these dozens of trucks that are going to these farmers to pick up these seed, to bring these seed and ship them off. And here, um, I just want to point, they label the burlap sacks that they're going from Mexico, from Northern Sonora, and it's called the India Supply Mission. Do you remember that image? Of the, fam the Mexican family that would feed the world. And here they are saying it's come to fruition. You know, here are Mexican farmers and they are sending their seed to the world. Um, so the idea of Mexico feeding the world. This is really important because let me just draw attention to that seed. Nowhere does it say Rockefeller Foundation, nor does it say United States nor does it say U.S. aid, which is a story that we know. So along the line, the tale gets changed. So the seeds arrive, and um, uh, Norman Borlaug is instrumental in meeting with Indian scientists and Indian agronomists. And uh, these seeds needed something that was very different. They needed more fertilizer. They needed irrigation. And basically, they were going to change the way that Indian, India farmed. So within a very short time, this is an article uh, from the Washington Post in 1977. So about 10 years after these seeds have been introduced. And here's what they're saying. It has been an incredible success. 
right? India used to produce 9.8 million tons of wheat. And five years later, it's producing 18 million tons. Pakistan used to produce 4 million. And in those five, same five years, it's producing 7 million tons of wheat. So if you are to look solely at yield, at uh, production, then yes, this is a story of success. What we now know, hindsight, is that this wasn't a story of success. This wasn't a story of feeding the world. But within this fear of the 1960s, there was this very clear fear of, of overpopulated world that would not be capable of feeding itself. You had books such as uh, Paul Ehrlich's who, The Population Bomb that warned that Malthusian, that Malthus had been tr right and that people were going to run out of food. And some of you may have seen this 1973 film, Soylent Green. And if you haven't, I'm going to ruin the plot for you because there is no more food in the world. And the only thing that they can eat, as you can see from the poster, are other humans. So there really is this concern and this fear that overpopulation, um, the population rise cannot keep up with the production of food. So um, Paul Ehrlich says the battle to feed, remember he wrote the population um, bomb and he says the battle to feed all of humanity is over. Basically it's lost war. Hundreds of millions would starve to death in the 1970s. He's saying, right? 65 million of them would be Americans and India, he says, is essentially doomed. I mean, there's no hope. England, he says, will not exist in the year 2000. These are his predictions. And so things look quite dire. So when you suddenly have a plant, a crop that is mass producing, indeed, this looks like a story of success. So successful, in fact, that William God, the USA, USAID director says, these and other developments in the field of agriculture contain the makings of a new revolution. It is not a violent red revolution like that of the Soviets, nor is it a white revolution like that of the Shah of Iran. I call it the green revolution. And so you have this idea that it's going to be science coming together with agriculture that is going to bring peace, that is going to bring plenty, and that it is going to feed the world. So as I said, the Green Revolution was a completely different frame of mind, for, um, especially changing how farming, which had been done the same way for millennia, you suddenly had a lot of outputs. And by outputs, I mean irrigation, fertilizers, mechanization, pesticides, and most importantly, hybrid seeds which needed to be purchased. Farmers could no longer reuse seeds that they had been using um, from the, for the previous harvest that they would store and use again. And this would create a series of problems. Specifically, um, so the Rockefeller, uh, when he goes to Mexico in 1967, it's billed as this great story of, of success. You see there, um, John D. Rockefeller sitting in front of a map of Mexico. And it's considered such a success that in 1970, the Nobel Committee awards Norman Borlaug, the agronomist who had come up with shuttle breeding, and the ag agronomist who initially is contacted by um, Indian scientists, and he goes, they award him the Nobel Peace Prize for his accomplishments in India and Pakistan, and for being, quote, the father of the Green Revolution, and for his role in ending hunger, uh, to end world hunger by increasing the world's food supply. This is a beautiful story, right? And this is the story that we tend to hear. And it's a story of triumph. It's a story that's really um, colored with American triumphalism, American uh, sci scientific innovation, and this story of um, uh, American know-how and diplomacy across the world. It's become so much a part of that narrative that almost all books, The Man Who Fed the World, feature Norman Borlaug, and it's very much, as I said, a, a narrative of the United States. Um, but in his address, Norman Borlaug says the following. 
It is the unusual breadth of adaptation combined with high genetic yield potential, potential, short straw, a strong responsiveness and high efficiency in the use of heavy doses of fertilizer and a broad spectrum of disease resistance that has made the Mexican dwarf varieties the powerful catalyst that they have become in launching the green revolution. So the reason I wanted to highlight that is that he's saying the Mexican dwarf varieties, but at some point, the idea that these are Mexican varieties developed in Mexico becomes curiously disassociated from the Mexican scientist who worked on this and Mexico the country and become very much a narrative, of, as I said, of Norman Borlaug. This will become an issue um, in the 1970s when the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development says, you know, we have farmers in African nations, in East Asia, in South Asia, who are planting these high yield varieties of grain. Shouldn't we look into it to try to understand the social and economic consequences of changing a way of life, farming life? And it's happening so quickly in a generation. So they send out several researchers and they, they uh, write up these reports. I think there are 14, or maybe 18 reports and the, the researcher who is sent to Mexico, Cynthia Hewitt de Alcantara, writes this extraordinary analysis. So she's there in the early 1970s, and she says, these hybrid seeds are breaking the networks, the social networks. We have farmers that are becoming indebted. We have a way of life that is being pushed aside because of mechanization. And we have a rising class of seed dealers and in bankers who are dealing with farmers who are uh, putting them more in debt. We need to step aside and look beyond the crop to see what's happening in rural Mexico. What she was looking or thinking about for Mexico could easily be applied to India. So what you begin to see with this embrace of the Green Revolution, immediately within a generation, you began to see environmental problems. Pollution, erosion of the soil, diminishing water sources, because remember these have to be irrigated, pesticide resistance, you needed stronger and stronger pesticides, and pesticides would th that would then be causing public health issues um, for the farmers themselves who were using these pesticides often much more, and the same for fertilizers than they needed to use. Social consequences, where you had small plot farmers who were now forced to um, purchase seeds. They were reliant on um, agriculture, reliant on industry, and it began to exacerbate regional inequalities. So what you see is that um, what had been seen in Mexico as happening as early as the 1960s the seeds themselves weren't traveling alone. What was traveling with the seeds were also the social and political and economic problems associated with them. In India, um, I'm sure all of you have heard her and are familiar with the farmer suicides. And if we trace the origins of these farmer suicides, we can go to these United Nations reports from across the world, remember these researchers found across the globe, and they're saying farmers are becoming indebted in order to buy seed. Farmers are becoming indebted in order to purchase fertilizer and pesticides because now we have created a very capitalistic way of farming, which is hybrid seed uh, dependent. And we have basically destroyed a way of life. Um, but what was of interest to, and to bring it back to the plant, what was of interest to the scientists was they were searching for the true genetic potential of wheat. So that seeds that would be, as you recall, highly responsive to fertilizer and for irrigation. And remember that this is a narrative of success. It's so successful that the agronomist Norman Borlaug wins the Nobel Prize for what he, the Nobel Peace Prize for what he has accomplished. And this is evidence that hunger can be tamed, that hunger can be solved via science. But we all know that 
hunger is not a scientific problem. Hunger is a social, political problem. So what you had were scientists who were working on a problem that had been framed incorrectly. So also, remember that Mexico, those farmers in Sonora, in northern Mexico, those farmers become the model that will then be exported as well. But something that I didn't mention, I just said in passing, is that those farmers in northern Mexico were not the poor farmers that Henry Wallace had visited and took picture, pictures with. The farmers of northern Mexico were commercial farmers. They were politically connected, economically stable, socially well-networked. They were not the farmers. So the Green Revolution does not start in, the, in rural South Mexico where you had subsistence farmers like the majority of the world. It begins in the North where you have a different type of farmer. But it's that model of farmer and farming that's going to get um, exported. So um, again, just a little, uh, so the Office of Special Studies, its acronym in Spanish was OEE, um, peaked in 1956 where you had 118 scientists, 100 of those scientists working on these seeds were Mexican. And the reason I mention this, to go back to what travels with seeds, you, the socioeconomic problems will follow the seeds, but not the narrative of who are the scientists that are working with the seed. Because when the seeds arrive to India, the seeds will be known as Borlaug's seed, or they will be known as American Aid or the Rockefeller Foundation. And this becomes apparent when Octavio Paz, whom you may know as the Nobel Prize winner in literature in 1990, but he, at, in 1966, when the Mexican seeds arrived, he was ambassador to India from Mexico. So he was the ambassador in Delhi. And he was um, the Mexican official who would be um, very aware of these Mexican seeds that are arriving to India. And he very quickly, so here he is with, uh, here's Paz with Nehru, and this is in Delhi in 1962. And Paz in the background, here he is with Indira Gandhi, um, and so this idea of Mexico and India relations are really being forged. Um, in um, Mexico would be the first country in Latin America to acknowledge, to recognize India's independence. And it very early sets out to have one of the first embassies in New Delhi as well, because Mexico sees India as a sister nation. And um, in part because of their colonial backgrounds and Mexico says we were uh, under the dominion of the Spanish Empire and our sisters and brothers in India were under the domain of the British. We were agriculturally based. We had aspirations to urbanize and to industrialize but also to do that through technology and science. Very important. We have a, a harsh urban rural divide and he said, even physically, our people look the same. This is what, this is what Paz is, is writing about in, in his memoirs. He, he writes this book, In Light of India, in which it's this love letter, basically, to India and the, and the years that he spent there. So um, Paz is there in New Delhi when you begin to have the arrival of these Mexican seeds. And he very quickly notices a problem. And he begins to write in these diplomatic memos. He says, interestingly, Mexico has never mentioned that they're the ones sending the seeds. It's often said that it's Norman Borlaug or thank you, United States. We want to thank the Rockefeller Foundation or the Ford Foundation. And he says, but I know that Mexican scientists are involved in this. Why aren't they talking about the Mexican scientists? And then he says, and also, why aren't they talking about the Indian scientists who are receiving the seeds and who are the ones who are doing the testing here on the ground? It's become a very narrow narrative of development aid. So much so that if you go back to Northern Mexico, the main boulevard that takes you to that experimental station was renamed the Norman Borlaug station. If you're staying in the hotel, which most uh, visitors stay at, there's a Norman Borlaug ballroom. 
And the research station was renamed after his death, the Norman Borlaug Research Station. Um, and every year there is a, a farmer's um, uh, extension that the farmers come and learn, which is the, the day of the farmer. And if you see here, I guess it would be your right hand corner, the shadow that you see there is that of Norman Borlaug. Deeply beloved, deeply respected, but also it's a very long shadow that really has narrowed this story. And at the entrance to the experimental station are the wheat, the hybrid wheats that were developed there. And at the back of this monument are a third of Norman Borlaug's ashes. He wished to be buried at the experimental station where so much um, of his work with different crops had taken place. So this idea of exporting that Mexico feeding the world really takes um, on a, a different role when we talk about the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, because it is here where seeds are being exported to the world. And I just put this in, it's not really related to um, the talk, but I thought um, people in Phytotopia might be really interested in this particular little uh, factoid. So this is a picture from, uh, from 2013, and it's Gates and um, Bill Gates and Carlos Slim, who at the time were the two richest men in the world. At the time, it was Carlos Slim, a Mexican. And it's the inauguration of the biosciences complex at CIMIT. And the idea was that we are entering a phase where water is going to become a problem for the world, that we will be an overpopulated world and there will not be enough food to feed the world. So we need to come up with new agricultural solutions to feed a hungry world. Does this sound familiar? Because I just told you about this, about the 1940s and 50s, and especially in 1960s. So here we're in 2013, and what they are inaugurating is a biosciences complex, which will be focused on studying um, not just diseases of plants, but ways of creating better, stronger seeds to deal with the coming drought um, in, that we will all be facing in the future. So these seeds, it comes back to developing, and again, science at the center of the solution to feed the world. So this is a terrible picture taken by me, and sorry, it's fuzzy, but um, these are seed packets of these seeds that are being developed that are sent for free to any farmer anywhere in the world that um, requests them. But also it's not just about sending seeds, it's also about training scientists. So every year, hundreds and hundreds of wheat scientists come to the two research stations in Mexico to learn how to think about wheat, to, uh, to basically create a wheat science mentality that is then be spread across the world. And they are known as the wheat apostles. Uh, at least that's how they were termed in the 1960s um, for Norman Borlaug. So we've spent a lot of time right now in Mexico. We need to now go across the world. And I'm going to take you specifically to Ludiana in the Punjab. So if we were to tether, create a line between Ciudad Obregón and the Punjab, do you see this map here? What do you see? You will probably see that Mexico and India line up in more ways than Octavio Paz told us in his book. The commonalities are beyond cultural and they are beyond, um, they lie on, in many, many parts of the countries on the same latitude. And this is important because Sonora, and you can't see where I'm pointing on my screen, but Sonora is within the same degree, within a variation of degrees of, lies within the Punjab. Now, this is important because what did not travel with the seeds was an idea that had been fermenting in Mexico for many years that agriculture and agronomists in particular had, had to have a social bent, that you couldn't have a capitalist idea pushing um, farming. You couldn't have farmers who needed to be buying shovels or, or seeds or other, um, that you needed to create a bond with the farmer and it would be a bond between science, 
scientist and the farmer. That bond is lost when we begin to have more of a capitalist idea. So you begin to hear less and less of an influence from these Mexican agronomists when the seeds travel. This is, um, this is especially sad, uh, a sad thing because some of these agronomists, or at least one in particular, was an Indian. So um, here is the Yaqui experimental station that, you had, um, that I had spoken about. And Mexico had this long tradition of experimentation um, well before the arrival of, of the Rockefeller Foundation. And in particular, do you remember um, the Norman Borlaug Experimental Station of the North? But the Experimental Station of the South is of great importance because in the 1920s, an Indian refugee named Pandurang Kankoje, whom I know you have in Phytopia, several images of him, he arrives at the National School of Agriculture. And the reason why I want to focus on him is because if we focus on Mexican agronomists, whom I won't today, but also if you focus on a figure such as Kankoje, the origins of the Green Revolution are not capitalist. They are instead socialist in nature. And they are influenced in large part by the desire of of in particular one Indian national to throw off the British Raj and to become independent and to use his knowledge of science, to use his knowledge of plants and to use his knowledge of society and especially his deep sympathy toward farmers to try to create a new society, a new world. And he does that not in India where he could not be, but he brings those ideas to Mexico. So you're going to have this very curious coming together, Mexico, which has just gone through its revolution to overthrow large landowners. And the, you have the peasants who are rising up and you're going to have agronomists who are going to have a new, um, agronomists who understand plants, who deal with crops. And in the midst of this, an Indian arrives to the National School of Agriculture. And what he sets out to do is to work on hybrid crops. He's going to be interested in particular in hybrid corn. And um, Kankoje is a really fascinating person. He's constantly trying to come back to India or to go back to India. And um, he can't because it, it's not until after independence that he will be able to go as an elderly man back to India. But while he's in Mexico, he's working on these new types of crops what new types of um, crops can be given to farmers, but more importantly, and this is what really excites me, he teams up with several Mexican um, politicians, artists, and they create a free school, which is going to be for a free school for farmers that's going to be socialist and anti-capitalist in nature. And the idea is that through science, that they will teach the farmer how to create better crops. They won't ask the farmer to pay for seed. They won't ask the farmer to pay for their education. It will be provided. And so what you see here, and it's a little hard, but a kankoje is standing um, right above the farming implement. And the rather robust man is Diego Rivera, the, the muralist whom Kankoje had met when Diego Rivera goes to the National School of Agriculture to paint a mural. And they begin to talk. And Diego Rivera is so fascinated by this Indian in Mexico that he says, oh, what are you working on? Do you remember this mural? So if you look at the front, so remember this mural is about a man who has learned to control the universe by understanding the... Uh, the skies by understanding diseases, but you can't have any of that without first understanding crops. And that's why you see plants at the front. Before physics, you have agriculture. And this is what Diego Rivera is trying to say. But importantly, many of the crops that are showcased here were some of the crops that Pandurang Kankoje was working on in his laboratory. So portrayed in this amazing mural is the power of Kankoje. But also in the Ministry of Education in Mexico, um, 
this, there's this wonderful mural, and it's called Our Daily Bread. And at the head of the table, breaking bread and feeding the world, which is represented around the table, both elderly and young, and from across different socioeconomic classes. Remember, this is in the center of the Ministry of Education. At the center, the person who feeds the world is Kanduran Kankoje. So you have this wonderful image of this recognition of, um, of Indian science and Indian beliefs within the uh, Mexican School of Agriculture, but also, um, and what you don't see here, is the, the networks that Kankoje was able to work together within the agronomist. So here, um, very quickly, this is each of these lights. So what happened to these farmers? Do you remember those farmers that had been part of this discourse in Mexico? In Mexico, um, these farmers embraced technology to a degree that if you go there today, they have an office or this institution that's called Central Command. And they are devoted now to preserving water. So each of those little light bulbs that you saw is a well that is monitored electronically and, and in real time to show how much water is in the valley. So it's just, these are farmers who control this knowledge. This is farmer innovation. They have moved beyond agriculture and have created a space in which the science that they are producing is helping them to build better crops, but in a much different way. So this idea of, of, um, of, of agriculture emerging together with science to produce better, um, better crops. But if we move again from Ciudad Obregón and back to India, in particular to the Punjab, what happened to those seeds when they arrived in India? So something really interesting. India, um, be shortly before the arrival of the seeds, there had been a series of um, agricultural universities created in India. And the goal of these agricultural universities was multifold. Um, in particular, it was to um, sponsor agricultural research, but also to teach and to extension, to bring knowledge, science to, to, um, to farmers. But you couldn't just do this within the universities. You also needed to create something that, was be, that wasn't contained within the walls of the university. And this is where um, the KVKs or the Krishi Vignya Kendras come into play. So do you remember how it, in Northern Mexico, you have the farmers who have become independent, have created their own science. In many ways, these KVKs of which today there are more than 600 throughout India, divided into eight different zones, most of which depend on um, agricultural universities regionally, but they also depend um, uh, to the ECAR. And the idea was that um, agricultural universities would provide the technical services, the demonstrations and technology transfer that was needed to create better farming technologies and knowledge, not just about crops, but also um, with animals and gardens and a series of other. Um, so in the, last, in the last few years, I've been visiting a couple of KVKs. This is in the north of India. This is in Jalandar farm. And the solutions that Indian farmers are coming with are extraordinary. They really are as amazing as the ones that we are seeing in the farming communities in Mexico. And I'll just very briefly, because I know I've, I've gone on much too long, the the what you see here uh, is a chicken roost, but you also see a pond of water. It appears, and when the chickens, it's a grate at the bottom. So when the chickens defecate, it goes into that water, which is then used to water the nearby crops, thus creating natural fertilizer in the water to already um, provide, and it becomes this ecosystem that is working together trying to avoid the purchase of fertilizer, trying to use everything and go back to this sense of a system that worked together. The system in which everything was used and reused and recycled and that nature itself was creating the system and not the need to be purchasing, which was this idea that was really ingrained in the mid 20th century. So as I said, um, what happens if we change the story? And we don't think of this arrival of seeds as, an, as development aid. 
What if instead we focus on the local and localized innovation? And I think if we go, for example, in the case of India to the KVKs, it's there where we begin to see how Indians were able to innovate with the seeds that were coming from Mexico and not and they stopped being Mexican seeds. They still had Mexican origins, but they were transformed into Indian seeds because they needed to meet the local needs of Indian soil, of Indian, um, and, and different, and a different Indian ecosystem. So here's another KVK, and this is uh, in Tamil Nadu. And what you have here is another case of if we look at the local, if we look at local science and local farmers and local communities beyond this narrative of, of U.S. innovation, we come up with very interesting solutions. So here on the left-hand corner, that is a, a, an Indian farmer who's showing me on his cell phone that he only produces organic crops, organic food, and he was having problems delivering it. So he was able to... Um, the ingenuity is amazing. He says, so I bought a truck and I decided that if the, I was going to cut out the middleman and that I would be the purveyor of my own crops and shuttling them around. And so when he, when I interviewed him, I said, so where, what was the business plan? He says, I don't need a business plan. I know it was going to work because people are hungry. They need the food. It was, it was going to work. So this, this notion of, importing different ideas and different models in a way what the KVKs were, um, were trying to do was not rely on imported models of technology and imported knowledge, but rather to create its own knowledge. The KVKs have, of course, um, they've had a lot of problems having to do with funding, with uh, centralization of knowledge, uh, creating hierarchies of knowledge within farming communities, focusing on some farmers versus others, focusing on some crops over others. So we can't just, um, again, we can't give a, a papered over vision, but the idea of the KVK in and of itself, I think is a really fascinating one because it shows, uh, again, the diversity of uh, microclimates in India, the diversity of knowledges that still thrive in India, the diversity of crops that can be marketed outside of traditional systems and the innovation that exists among Indian farmers and all they need is, for example, a truck in this case. And then you can then yield and produce more. It's not the grand scale of a global capitalist world, but it's on a scale that can transform little by little, incrementally, the world by using one crop, one plant. And um, with that, plants take on a different meaning. They take on the local meaning and they don't become this narrative of a green revolution, but rather a localized narrative in which the plant has a lot more meaning because it's created by someone for whom the crop needs something completely different. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriela. That was a very fascinating lecture. The sort of, I, I think it's safe to say that a lot of us are unaware of the multiplicity of stories and histories that actually go behind um, the idea of solving hunger in the world. And um, thank you for reminding us of uh, the revolutionary roots of the Green Revolution. Um, Thank you so much, Gabriela. I'd just like to remind our audience that our speaker would be available to take your questions at 7.30 p.m. So don't forget to tune in for that conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. to the second evening of Science Gallery Bengaluru's online exhibition, Phytopia. Welcome, a special welcome to Gabriela Sotolaviaga, a colleague and 
and a professor at the University of Harvard. Allow me to introduce to you Phytopia. It's our first online and third exhibition since we started programming last October. This time, as we did with Submerge, our earlier exhibition, we are also partnering with the BIC. A quick word for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Science Gallery Bengaluru is established in partnership with the Indian Institute of Science, National Center for Biological Sciences, and Trishti Institute of Art, Technology, and Design. We are a part of an international network of galleries with seven other galleries across the world. And in India, we are established with funding primarily from the government of Karnataka. We would love for you to complete feedback forms once you have had the opportunity to listen to us and had the opportunity also to see the exhibition. Today, you can post your questions in the question and answer box. I'll take now the opportunity to introduce our speaker today, Gabriela Sotolaviaga. She's a professor of history of science and the Antonio Madero Professor for the Study of Mexico at Harvard University. She specializes in modern Latin America. Her first book, Jungle Laboratories, Mexican Peasants, National Projects and the Making of the Pill, won the Robert Merton Best Book Prize in Science, Knowledge and Technology Studies from the American Sociological Association. She's working on a second monograph, which is almost about to come out, on the role of healthcare providers in Mexico. It's her latest book project that excites us all because it seeks to re-narrate the histories of 20th century agricultural development aid from the point of view of India and Mexico, the talk that you just were hearing. Gabriela is at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton for this academic year. And so we are happy, very, very happy for her to join us this time and give us, you know, a wonderful peek into her work, uh, which involves India and Mexico and the intriguing and wonderful figure of Pandurang Khan Koje. So Gabriela, thank you very much for the talk. I will take the opportunity to, to ask you a couple of questions to begin with, following which we will open the session to our audience and get them to ask you questions as well. So the very first question is, what took you to this study. So what about Khan Koje drew you to it? Or what, what in fact even took you to Khan Koje at all? And, uh, and when? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first, before I, I answer, I want to say what a great honor it is for me to be joining you in my morning, your night. And I, I want to say that with Phytopia and with the Bengaluru uh, Center, I think it's amazing the innovation from the ground up and what an amazing opportunity. And I really feel truly uh, enthusiastic and honored to be a part of this. So thank you for the invitation. So to answer your question, um, what took me to the study? What took me to Kankoje? So I, I think it's a two part question. Um, my initial project began as a question of nutrition. In the early 1940s, there was this debate in Mexico about races. Um, and which racial hierarchy was more important or stronger. And one of the studies was to determine if indigenous people, if they were quote unquote backward because of what they ate. It was a question of nutrition. It was a racist ideology couched within this terms of science. So these nutritional studies began and, and I thought, oh, this will be my next book project. But then when I began to read, I realized it wasn't so much a question of nutrition, but as a question of what they considered to be the right crop. And the right crop was not corn, the Mexico, the land of corn, but it was wheat, which was this European import, which had suddenly, at, in the mid 20th century, become this notion of advancement. And it was this attempt to try to change nutritional uh, consumption, what people were eating, because they believed that what they ate could make them more advanced. This completely shocked me. So when I began to think more about wheat, then I realized that Mexico is one of the leading exporters of wheat seeds to the world. 70% of, of the wheats planted in wheat seeds or strains planted around the world today all emerge from one 
laboratory center in Mex in, no in northern Mexico. Again, this was a this was a, a, a data that shocked me. And the more I began to look into this, I stumbled across this book, um, and it was written by Savrita Sani, who's pictures I know she has uh, lent for your exhibit. And she wrote this extraordinary book, uh, I Shall Never Ask for Pardon. And it is the biography of her father, uh, Pandurang Kankoje. Mm -hmm. And it begins with his time in India, but then his really, pair, it's almost an odyssey. It's mm -hmm. like reading a Greek legend, um, how he travels across the world and how he ends up in the Americas. First in California, he's part of the Gadara, the Gadara movement, but then he makes his way to Mexico. And in following Cancoje is when I realized this isn't a story about Mexico and nutrition. It's a story about the exchange of knowledge between Mexico and India. And that we have been telling the history of the Green Revolution wrong because we have been focusing on the United States. We have been focusing on American scientists and American agronomists and while that, that's pivotal, what was more important were the Indian scientists and the Mexican scientists who were making these seeds their own and in their own societies. Wonderful. This is this. I'm fairly certain. I mean, as, as you're aware, I'm a historian of science myself. You know, I've studied in India and, and then later, you know, our paths crossed in other places. But I myself encountered Khan Koji much later in life, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's it's um, it's it's actually news to many Indians that at the root of the the research that went into what made the Green Revolution possible is the collaboration between Mexican scientists and an Indian scientist who who sort of wandered his way into Mexico, uh, becoming yes. incredibly good friends with Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, who even painted a, a, a mural for him, etc. From, from your eyes, could you take a couple of moments to tell us a little bit more about Khan Koje and how he looks through your eyes, you know, as, as, a, as a person? Because, you know, there is, there is the story of him in India before he reaches the Americas. And then there's the story of him in Mexico, you know, with a vibrant cultural and political scene. And then, of course, his return to India after that. Yeah, so from a personal point of view, Yes. He's an extraordinary individual. When you think of all he had to do to, number one, get to the Americas, it's really extraordinary. There's one passage in particular that um, I think really summarizes the type of individual he was and the persona that he had. When he was in California, um, he arrived with very little social network or support. And um, there were times when there was no money, where he was unable to eat. And mm -hmm. it, he begins to go to the nearby, so Central California, as many of you might know, is this is the one of the breadbaskets of the world. So there are agricultural farms. And it is there where he meets migrant workers, where mm -hmm. he himself would go initially, um, A, seeking labor, because what are you going to do at this time in in the early teens in San Francisco, which had recently been ravaged by the earthquake. I mean, there's all of, of these um, different paths that are crossing. And I think he has a several qualities which I deeply admire. One, he was a go-getter. <laughs> this, this man, no obstacle was going to stop him. Not the ability to speak Spanish, because when he arrives in Mexico as a professor, he does yeah. not speak Spanish, which is remarkable. So he. He's, so he's a go-getter, incredibly ambitious because mm -hmm. he's able to bring himself up. But what is one of the through lines throughout is his immense love for the land that he has been forced to leave behind. Mm -hmm. So he's constantly trying to get back to India. And in the archives, I find these letters which are really emotional, where he's trying to... Uh, convince Indian authorities, as, as you may know, to let him come back, when, especially right after I Indian independence. And at the same time, he is a foreigner in Mexico. He is an immigrant in Mexico. So in the Mexican archives, what I'm finding are petitions for him to be able to stay longer in Mexico that are mm -hmm. constantly being granted. And as with most 
uh, immigrants or migrants, papers are really important to him because this is what gives him uh, legitimacy, validity in this world in which he's navigating. Mm. Um, also, he, he really immerses himself in Mexican culture. And as, as someone who comes from Mexico, he begins, myself, uh, in Cancoje, I see the affinity that he felt for Mexico is what I feel for India. So there's also, he's able to see these connections and really root himself. Mm. So, and also, he's incredibly smart. You have to be very, very nimble intellectually to be able to do the many jobs that he did. He's involved with the Mexican Railroad Company. He's involved with steroid hormone production. If you put any of the key points in Mexican history for about 20 years, Kankuji is there. I mean, he's, he's there, as you mentioned, with this uh, artistic uh, elite, Diego Rivera, with Frida Kahlo, with Tina Modotti. Th this is an incredible cultural sphere, but he's also part of, a, a, he's very well connected with the Mexican political elite. So here's mm -hmm. someone who's also a, an amazing diplomat. Um, as I said, I have great admiration for him as an individual, and it speaks very highly of, I think, in this time, especially right now in the United States, where there's so much backlash against immigrants and migrants, I think the tenacity that he portrays is something that many migrants and immigrants show when they arrive in a country, and they're the ones who bring up with their labor and their innovation and their creativity, they bring up society. It's quite incredible to to hear to hear in your words the story of a, of a man you know who who left India and and uh, of course not of not of his own volition but uh, because of political reasons as a co-founder of the Gadar Party, uh, yes. where the British would have wanted to arrest him, he and several of his colleagues then find their way to uh, Mexico and, and uh, in a story that you so beautifully narrated, uh, just a little bit about his time in the United States. Uh, do I remember correctly that he 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 educated himself there, or what was what he, what did, what did he kind of yeah what did he gain there? So he initially went to um, Berkeley, to the University of California at Berkeley, and mm -hmm. Berkeley had this agricultural program. So he begins his studies there, but then he also um, goes a bit further north, and he also um, he gets a degree from the University of Oregon. So. Mm -hmm. He, um, again, very well connected. And a lot of it had to do with the ability to pay where he was, where he, he was a student. And again, though there was a significant Indian population in San Francisco. And um, curiously, um, there is a, a very large Punjabi population in California at this time. Mm -hmm. And just as an aside, there's this wonderful book about Punjabi Mexicans because the, those who came, the Punjabi, it was all men who were coming initially to work in the fields and then they created their own businesses. And when they arrive, they realize that the women who look most like them are Mexicans. So there is this significant Punjabi Mexican population okay. in, uh, in California. So there is, uh, uh, in California, Indians from various regions. So he's able to make those networks but still, in terms of education, he's financing this on his own. Hmm. Which, is, which, is, uh, which is truly uh, impressive. But also, impressive. It, it, it reminds us of how in the early half of the 20th century, Berkeley was a place for many, yes. many to take refuge. And in my own work, for example, uh, the physicist Bernard Peters, who oh, escaped yes. from Dachau uh, from, a, from, a, from a concentration camp in Germany, found his way also to Berkeley and then studied with Robert Oppenheimer, among other people. Mm. But, but curiously enough, in the 1950s, under the McCarthy era, when um, he, you know, as, as sort of a left-leaning Berkeley person who had escaped, uh, escaped Dachau for being left-leaning, um, he, of course, came under attack. And that's when he found himself in India. And then he lived here for over a decade and then, you know, finally went to De Denmark where he headed the Danish Atomic Energy Commission uh, and, and his family still lives there. So it, it, it and the circle kind of came ridiculously close when uh, uh, I found myself asking a student called Alexandra Peters in my classroom, 
you know, oh, you're coming from Denmark. Would you know? Ha ha ha. And as it turned out, she was his granddaughter, which was which was oh, wow. sort of a wonderful moment. But coming back to Berkeley and, you know, the, the, that it was a place of refuge for many people for political and other reasons, which would explain why, for example, Khan Koji would find himself in Berkeley Absolutely. among the first places to go to. So coming coming back to plants, which is what has brought us together uh, this time, um, you know, so Khan Koji's experiments, I mean, among the beautiful, beautiful image that Tina Modotti takes of his experiments, he's working on corn, right? And an incredible sort of, you know, beautiful images, but also incredible work on corn. But would you be able to say a little more about the free agricultural schools that he set up together with Mexican colleagues and yeah. you know, what, what, that, what all that stood for? And, you know, in a sense, how it belongs in the history of farming. Uh, the relationship between between experiment and farming, right? Like uh, experimental stations yeah. and farming. Yeah. So I think this is where stories, where my interests really came together when we begin to think about, for example, the free schools of agriculture. Yeah. So um, uh, when Kankoje arrives in Mexico, Mexico has a very protracted and bloody revolution that mm -hmm. lasts from 1910 until 1917. And Kankoje will arrive a few years later to Mexico, but the country is still in political turmoil. There, it's still remaking itself after nearly a decade. So one of the goals of um, the Mexican revolution, number one is to get land for the landless, to break up the large estates, education, water. I mean, these, these basic tenets. And when Kankoji arrives, he sees many similarities with what he saw the British Raj and the oppression of colonialism and the oppression of a political system in Mexico that had favored the wealthy, the large estates, and had repressed and um, really subjugated the farming class. Mm -hmm. And that's what leads to the revolution. So when he is a, when he's at the National School of Agriculture, which is training the agronomist of the future with these revolutionary ideas, he really finds a home, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. he arrives just in the fervent that's still happening with the revolution. And many of those who are going to bring this change are those who are being educated as scientists of agriculture, scientists of the land, of the fields, who are then going to take that knowledge to farmers. Mm -hmm. But he's seeing that that is not enough. So, that might be wonderful if you're close to an experimental station. That might be fantastic if you're in the proximity of a school. But what happens if you are not? Or what happens if uh, in Mexico there are over 60 languages spoken and Spanish is just one? So mm -hmm. what happens if the language of instruction is Spanish and not these indigenous languages? Mm -hmm. So he comes up with this idea, again, in this fervent of, of change, that they're going to create free schools of agriculture so that regardless of your ability to pay or not, we go back to this theme, the ability to pay for education, yeah, yeah, yeah. that if you are a farmer, you can attend. And this again goes to his ability to bring people together. I'm not certain how he was able to gather money <laughs> to create these, these initiatives, but the photos that we have from Tina Modotti um, that Savitri Sani thankfully saved and they're now real treasures. Um, and they, they show us these farmers in these rural landscapes, in these makeshift schools. And um, in the newspapers, you begin to see in the early 1920s in farming competitions that members of these free schools are winning their crops because they're the bigger, lusher crops. So when they begin to win these crop competitions. Hmm. And uh, so with these free schools, it's bringing together this fervor that he had for revolution, for overthrowing um, the empire. And he finds a home in Mexico. And what you have is these peasant organizations that are writing to him. And curiously, some of these writings um, are found in New Delhi, not in Mexico, because mm -hmm. he saved them. And um, again, Savitri Sani donated them uh, to the Timurti in, in Delhi, yes. and they're housed in that archive. And it's this correspondence between peasant leagues in Mexico who are asking that they create a, a school in their, in their village. Um, and so you begin to see the impact of these schools that were very modest from the outside, 
But if there was no school in your proximity and you suddenly have one, and what the teaching goal is about making you independent of middlemen, hmm. very, of creating your farm, farm, farm space, of creating better crops for your profit and the profit of your community, not for the profit of, of just capital and to create this different mindset. And uh, just very fine, um, quickly, and experimental stations were crucial for this. And Kankoje says every farm, every in everyone's backyard is a laboratory. Mm-hmm. Everything is an experimental station. So to ferment this idea of, of creativity, of, of everyone can innovate, you don't have to be a scientist. And I love that. I love this, this idea that all farmers who had been um, put down for, for centuries had suddenly, you know, you can be a scientist. You can, you can research. Um, so I think the schools of, uh, the free schools of agriculture, unfortunately did not survive for that long. They were part of this move where so many initiatives were, were, take, were being taken on, but there's also a lot of political movement and they don't survive the political movement. Hmm. So this is, I mean, it's, it's, in, it's again, you know, um, sort of today's probably the day of bringing things, um, you know, circularly to, to uh, you know, to, to kind of round up, to, to close. Because uh, in India, the, the emergence of Mohandas Gandhi as a leader, as, as a leader of the, of the freedom movement, also begins uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a protest by indigo farmers, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the first Satyagraha in Champaran. Which he, which he goes and leads at the invitation of the farmers uh, because of, of course, the rise of German aniline dyes and therefore the decline in indigo trade globally, which leads to um, lots of extender, you know, so, so they, they set up experimental stations, like you said, you know, uh, for bettering the quality of natural indigo that doesn't go very well, leads to decline in profits because commercially indigo is no longer being sold and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible story on its own one that you know, uh, some of our colleagues have, of course, written about. But in, in, in light of the Kankoje story, it also becomes interesting that, you know, that, that uh, in effect, peasant rebellions can work in different ways, right? Or peasant Absolutely. revolt or protest can work in different ways. And, and, and that's, that's an inseparable story from the story of crops and therefore plants. Um, so uh, I will move on to allow other, I mean, I could talk to you forever. Uh, and, you know, uh, but I think let's, let's also give, um, you know, uh, the chance to, uh, to some others to also ask us questions. So uh, there's one question uh, Nityanand wants to ask you, which is that one of the elements of the conventional narrative of the Green Revolution is the PL480 program. Uh, mm-hmm. Could you talk about where, it's, where it fits in this picture that you've just talked about? Yes. Um, thank you for that question. And it's okay. So the PL 480 program, for those of you who may not be fam- familiar, it was part of this food aid narrative, part of the uh, a loan to provide uh, food. So when um, when the Indian uh, community decides that they're not going to go, there's this debate because for the PL 480 that would create another dependency or another type of uh, financial dependency on the United States for a country that had just become independent. Hmm. So when, um, and India is looking for other solutions other than uh, attaining a loan. And it is in part because of these, uh, this search for other solutions that you have, for example, Brazil offers to send it wheat as well, as long as India can pay for, um, for the transport. The, the problem with the PL480 uh, is that they would not accept payment in rupees. It had to be uh, um, changed to dollars, which was a, a, a terrible, if you looked at the long run, this was not a good deal <laughs> in any situation. So it's within the, and this is where Mexico really understands and asserts itself. Mexico that has long had a tradition of being subjugated by loans, especially when, it, um, when it's attempting to create a financial independence. 
So it's in this aftermath of these negotiations for the PL 480 that you see this negotiation of the Rockefeller Foundation and the Mexican government that both come together and begin to send the seed to India. So from my perspective, the PL 480 is one of the propellers that launches what would then become the Green Revolution because it's the attempt to look for other solutions that aren't uh, created by the, the need for a loan that would then uh, have strapped India in a very difficult situation. But also um, India as a nation, strategically, geographically, as we know, was coveted by, in this time, the, the Cold War, by the two powers. So India is really in, in a really good negotiating position, if we want to call it that, because of its geography, because of where it's located and what it meant for the Soviet Union and what it meant for the United States. And despite that, you know, P PL 480, they weren't necessarily the greatest of terms for a country that needed aid at that moment. Hmm. Right. Um, and yet, you know, I mean, in a sense, so I think, and of course, then the wheat story plays out. I mean, PL 480, of course, sends India, yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, wheat and, and uh, among, among the other sort of stories that is known of the PL 480, and I, I, maybe you've picked this up, Gabriel, already on your journeys to India. There's a certain weed that came with um, an American weed. It's a grass um, that came with the wheat. And because the wheat came under the regime of the Indian National Congress at that point of time, or that, or that they were in power, the grass came to be called as Congress grass. And I, I hope someday somebody writes the stories of, of, of you know, these um, species that in effect came with aid and, you know, and then sort of uh, took over landscapes. Uh, uh, and it's quite, quite interesting, actually. So uh, I do see it occasionally now. It, it was much more abundant mm. when I was younger. Very interesting. Um, so, uh, yes, so aid, stories of aid, you know, also, also uh, pan out differently. Uh, there's another question. I don't know how you, how you feel about this, but Arun wants to ask you, plants are now being genetically modified to become disease resistant and tolerant to droughts. Do you think this is going to increase the income of farmers by making farming more productive in an increasingly challenging climate or would it exacerbate existing social inequalities? I mean, I, I, I'm not sure the, the sort of, you know, the, the concluding part of it is probably, uh, probably something you want yes. to take up, but how would you approach, um, you know, sort of the yes. modification of plants, right? Which is something, of course. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's a fantastic question. And it's fantastic for many reasons. First, because it has this, how, what do, why do we modify plants? Hmm. And why do we think we can make better plants? But it's also in, in a second part question, which is the question of climate change and how that's, so I'll take this as a two part question. So um, we as a humans, as a species have constantly been modifying plants. We, when you look at farming for millennia, it was about creating better, by creating parent races, taking them to create a better crop and resistance to disease was actually one of the leading causes that led to the initial hybrid wheats, which are def different than genetically modified wheats. We have been making hybrid plants, uh, grafts of trees and grafts of, uh, for, for millennia. And the idea was to create, in terms of wheat, a species that would be resistant to rust, which mm. could, a uh, rust disease, which could, in many ways, destroy an entire farmer's crop. And it was very difficult to eradicate. So when you had, when you create parent wheat plants who are resistant to rust, the idea was that would save, um, with a hybrid seed, that that would save the farmer's crop. The problem is mm. that hybrid crops lose their potency after generations. And that means that farmers have to constantly be buying seed. And this is the problem with genetically modified seeds, that they have been tweaked as well so that the potency is lost, forcing farmers to not rely on the seed from previous years, but to continue to purchase seeds. So it has changed the whole process, which I'm sure all of you know, but the whole process of farming in, in many different ways. So to get back to the very astute question that was posed in terms of how does that, um, how does the, what are the social implications of the fight for disease? 
Um, it really depends on how we approach this problem. If it is approached as a business model, where mm -hmm. it is about extraction of capital from farmers because mm -hmm. farmers are concerned with disease, it's, it's not going to be an equitable playing field. But if we approach this problem of farming in general, food provision in general, as one that we on a global scale benefit if farmers have strong livelihoods, mm -hmm. then it's a very different story. So I, I think to answer the question of Russ before I address the, by creating rust resistance, we also had to create more use of insecticide and pesticide and all these other chemicals which are now dam damaging and have damaged our soils. So it's a very tricky balance in terms of disease is a very particular one because plants, as you know, as all living things get sick and they need, they need care. So where, is the, where are the scales? And in the mid 20th century, the idea was to produce more crops, more yield, at whatever cost. And whatever cost, that's what has now created so many of the problems, social problems that we're seeing now. To, so that's a really a non-answer, but it's to say the answer is we need to find a balance when it comes to disease and plants. Now with regard to climate change, again, that's, that's a really interesting question. What do we do? I'm seeing now um, with the Farmers in, in Sonora, and when I was in Chennai recently with Javnavi, uh, I was able to go to a KVK near Chennai, and climate change is a concern throughout this, this uh, for monsoon rains that come or come too long in Mexico, droughts that are taking much too long. And so I'm seeing with the farmers in particular in Mexico that borders the Sonoran desert, the desert is expanding. So they keep asking scientists to produce different, better, again, that's the word, right? Better seeds that are able to uh, combat the desert uh, heat and the aridity. But they're always a step behind because climate change is now happening so quickly, right? And, and science takes time. So you're now, we're in this vicious cycle where the farmers are in some ways the gatekeepers of what's happening in our food production line what's happening to our crops, what's happening to our plants. And they're like, science, we need a solution. And we need it fast, but then something else is, is happening. So uh, as the final sentence to, to this person's question, I think we need to really, as a, hum as a global humanity, think about how climate change is affecting farming because we all need to eat. We all depend on on how that's changing the, ch the chain of, of supply. Yeah. In fact, Marisha has a question that follows up on exactly that. Uh -huh. She's asking that it's becoming apparent in India now that extensive wheat and rice cultivation um, during the Green Revolution has caused huge water and, I mean, has had huge water and climatic costs, right? And, and soil costs as well. I mean, we have salinity in soil gone up uh, to crazy levels. So she wanted. She wants to know if this is also the case in Mexico, and is there a solution being thought of for this? That Marisha is is a wonderful. Another wonderful question. So to answer your question, this was known at the beginning, and this is one of the things that has been most shocking about the research that I have been doing, because um, scientists knew very early on that the scientific solutions were, were going to have social implications. But again, we need to put ourselves within the context of when the Green Revolution was happening. It's a Cold War scenario. Who's going to win the race? And Javnavi, as you know, many of these atomic solutions or other scientific solutions, um, it was about getting there fast, regardless of the cost or pushing aside the social cost. Um, so when we talk about the implications for Mexico, it's quite interesting because I, I spoke briefly about the Mexican Revolution, but the, and it was basically, in many ways, many, many revolutions rolled up into one, and one was the uprising of the peasants. But if you were to look at 
the condition of these peasants, of these farmers in the 1950s and 60s, they were very similar to what they had been in the 19th century, sadly. So there were still large estates. So when you have these development of these hybrid seeds, they are developed not for the small farmer, for the mm. subsistence farmer, which is the majority of the world, but these green revolution seeds are developed for commercial farmers, for large estate farmers. And this gets to your question, Marisha, which deals with irrigation, the capital needed for irrigation, capital needed for all these other inputs, fertilizer, pesticides, etc. So in Mexico, what they're now trying to do, there's now this attempt to what they're calling like green, green revolution, like the, these attempts to be more conscious of, um, of a more holistic taking in the environment. And interestingly, bringing up for, to the foreground, the question of gender, because mm -hmm. many of the majority of farmers actually in many places are women. Mm -hmm. And normally when we talk about farming, women issues are not, are not front and center. So Mexico has this current program, it's called Mas Agro, which focus, focuses on women and women farmers. And this of course changes frame, the framing of how farming is approached and it's considered to be, and again, this is a gendered idea, but women as caregivers and, and keepers of the earth, that this is also the keepers, that they will have a better um, uh, understanding of the world. And I'll just say this last thing. Uh, there are attempts, and some have been successful, but not as fast. There's this question of, of how fast solutions are happening. There's this problem right now in the Sea of Cortez, which is near Sonora. It's been a problem for years. And it's the kelp forest. Mm -hmm. And um, they didn't know why the kelp forest would bloom and begin to grow at this. Uh, and there was so much that they were asphyxiating the fish in this very rich ecosystem. And it turned out that it was all the runoff from the farming fields of um, this valley where the Green Revolution begins because of the use of fertilizers, which are high in nitrogen. And all of that was washing into the Sea of Cortez. So Marisha, to get to your question, to, your, to answer your question, there are solutions, but there are also age long problems that are still not being solved and others that are coming about. So I keep saying it's a balance, but again, it goes back to this balance. Yeah. Which again leads in beautifully into the next question from Siddharth, who wants, who wonders if you could speak a little more to the juxtaposition of indigenous localized agroecologies uh, and the universalization of crop varieties that eventually the Green Revolution worked for. But what he's interested in understanding is how, if at all, did this unfold in Kankoje's time and work? Mm. You know, so sort of the, the, you know, in a sense, the lab and the farm, right? Like, um, yes. So I think, uh, again, thank you for that, that really wonderful question. So I think if we, if we were, uh, so let's look at Kankoje, what he was trying to do, and then put it with what happened. Um, I wrote this article called The Socialist Origins of the Green Revolution because we mm -hmm. tend to think of the Green Revolution as, uh, and it's coming out next month, and uh, we tend to think of the Green Revolution as a capitalist solution. Um, but if we use Kankoje as one of the originators, he was about local knowledge, right? He was about bringing, um, and it was, more than 100 free schools of agriculture, which meant that it wasn't one model. It wasn't one model of education for all. It wasn't one model of farming for all. It was about um, bringing the local needs, local farming needs, but also local cultural understandings of, farmer, of farming. Um, you can't disassociate that. And that was one of the problems with the Green Revolution, which as Siddharth um, no noted, you know, when you have this universal solution, mm. you, the, the problems that were local don't disappear. They just are exacerbated. Mm. So I, I think to, to get this juxtaposition between local and universal, what if we had followed a model like the Mexican agronomist and Cancoje was a part of where they were saying, look, we need to take a look at the histories of struggle of these farmers. We can't mm. disassociate land tenure issues and water issues from productivity. 
Imagine if that had been our narrative instead of let's yield more, yeah, let's yeah. produce more. Then we would have said, well, here in this, in Southern India, mm-hmm. we, we have these problems which are linked to this historical tradition. But in Northern India, because it's a different climate, because again, a different tradition, different religion, different understanding, we have a different panorama of how farming should be approached. What if we had done that? Mm. We would have a much more inclusive understanding of what farming is and its role within society. But we Mm. didn't do that, right? We pushed the solution, which was like, this is going to produce more and be great. And farmers need to adapt to this model, not the model adapting to farmers. Yeah. You have, you have an uncanny knack for anticipating the next questions. I mean, not <laughs> only in terms of extraction, but also, also in terms of ideologies. Our next question is from one of our, in fact, Phytopia uh, program speakers, Emilia Terracciano. Uh, it's great to have you here, Emilia, uh, whose question is, um, his biography, so Kankoch's biography seems to suggest that both capitalism and revolutionary communism share a common desire to master nature. I mean, if you look at industrial farms of the Soviet Union, for example, right? And control it for, if not profit, then food sovereignty, right? (laughs) On either side of the fence. So Kankoje, after all, uh, Emilia says, was both fascinated by communism and the problem of hunger, as well as seeking to, uh, in a way, profit financially from his own initiatives, although he was less less successful in the latter project. So uh, how would you, in a way, yeah, how would you answer this? (laughs) <laughs> so the, the question, if I understood it, is uh, Kankoje's personal, uh, yes. how he's personally seeking. Well, he was also, this is, Emilia, Emilian, thank you for this really interesting question. So I will try to answer with what, how I understand he may have been thinking given the, given the context. Kankoje, by, um, when he's in Mexico, but it's, he are, will already have a family and has to support them. And because of these political turnovers, Kankoje is constantly losing his position. Because in Mexico, what happens when every six years when there's a new president, he changes all his, all his cabinet, but also at all levels. Hmm. So Kankoje, as basically a refugee in Mexico, was in a very vulnerable position. And uh, he is, when the Rockefeller Foundation actually goes into Mexico in 1943, Kankoje requests to be employed by them. He, hmm. And he's constantly seeking employment because he's getting these very um, short-term employments. So there's Kankoje, uh, the revolutionary, right? And as all humans, he's a complicated individual because you have this revolutionary zeal, which Emilia, as you rightly point out, is, you know, this uh, endeavor for food sovereignty, Hmm. for farmer sovereignty, um, but at the same time to to provide a well-being for the farmers. And how can you marry those? And uh, the idea was that you could, if the idea wasn't that you were doing this for profit. But at the same time, he as an individual needs to be making a living. So I I think for me, how do I uh, bring those two I don't think they're necessarily disparate. I think um, the quest of a farmer to provide better crops is also a quest to have a living, to to make a comfortable living and to provide more for their family than for the future generation that they did, than they did. Kankoji was involved in a lot of, um, he also was involved in mines, which didn't go well so it was like mining and all these other sectors. I mean, it really is extraordinary. And it's, it is, of course, for profit because he's trying to make a living in, in a very precarious situation. Thank you, Amelia, for that really, really interesting question. So uh, there's one more question uh, from Mohammed Bhatia. What he wants, what he's interested in is understanding the entry of Bill Gates into agronomy and ah. into um, well, effectively using AI and high tech. Um, yes. How is that? Or in a way, do you see signs of a similar kinds of 
um, uh, similar kind of processes unleashing as the green revolution um, or what you know in, in effect what does that signal and how do we understand this entry right i mean it, it, one thing is of course very clear it's an important problem of today and hunger it, you know food security and yes. hunger are problems uh, but how does one read his entry into the scene so, oh, this know, is history this is, yeah this is an exciting question yes. because if you look it's not sim it's not just bill gates um, but it's also howard buffett for example the son of warren buffett who has his main foundation, his organization, is an, a foundation that is devoted to agriculture, but because he was a farmer, a, a lifelong farmer. It, mm, so Warren Buffett and um, Bill Gates and Carlos Slim for a long time were battling who was the richest man in the world, and it's now the Amazon guy. Um, <laughs> but it's uh, for Warren Buffett, he did not give his children money. He wanted them to create their own livelihood. And Howard Buffett became a farmer, a quite successful farmer in, in middle America. And then and less than a decade ago, they each, each of the children received a significant amount of money to create a foundation and devote it to what they thought was the most pressing problem for the globe. Mm -hmm. And for Howard Buffett, it was farming and it was the provision of food. So following along the lines of Bill Gates, who again are embracing science and here is where Mohammed, your question is so exciting to me in many ways there's many similarities with what more with the foundation that howard buffett and uh, with africa and its approach to africa is doing with say the rockefeller foundation mm -hmm. where you have these philanthropic organizations with good intentions <laughs> to to bring a solution and I think one of the things that is different, and I'm hoping for a different solution, is that Howard Buffett himself was a farmer for decades. Mm -hmm. So he understands um, farming and he understands crops and uh, livestock in a different register than say the ones who were running uh, the Rockefeller Foundation earlier. Although some of the Rockefeller men uh, also were, they had, factories of, of fertilizer, not coincidentally. <laughs> so, um, so to answer your question, I think there are parallels, but I also think we are now more aware mm -hmm. of the problems of these one solution for all. And uh, I don't know how far these social so, uh, uh, examinations these his socio-historical understandings of society travel up to these uh, ranks. Um, Obama, before he left office, had said that we needed a new green revolution for Africa. Mm -hmm. And that was set off red alarms. And for those of us, how are you understanding green revolution? You know, how are you understanding it as it was applied in South Asia and East Asia in the mid 20th century? Or is this a new conception? So Mohammed, I think, there are many parallels between these very wealthy individuals attempting to solve problems, but it's how we approach the solution of these problems. Is it going to be, to get back to one of the previous questions, a localized solution that will have more impact in, for the better of the, in, or a universal solution where people on the local, on the ground need to try to fit into this universal solution so that they can get aid, either be it through seeds or mechanized um, farm implements or whatever it may be. So Mohammed, stay in touch because I think right now, <laughs> this is going to be yes, one yes. of the crucial questions. Who defines how yes. we solve? And, and one final thing, it's how we couch the narrative. If it's a problem of hunger, a problem um, because no one should be hungry in the world. We have enough for everyone. It's hunger, as we all know, is a politically constructed, a socially constructed problem. So how do we frame this problem? Is it going to be a problem of, um, of science? Is it going to be a problem of variety? Is it going to be a problem of yield? We've learned, the, we've seen what happens when we do that. I mean, this is this is wonderful. I, I I'd like to ask you one more question, but before I ask that, a comment, um, you know, on on um, history. Why you know why what some of us do is 
that's so incredibly important because not only the history of the foundations and their involvement in diplomacy, in geopolitics, in shaping agricultural practices the world over, you know, with the Rockefeller Foundation and now with various other foundations that are coming in, but also precisely, as you said, the narratives, right? Like how, how when you make it a technocratic narrative of, of more yield, it leads to, it, it leads to certain paths. And um, when, when you have other narratives, it, leads, it might open up other parts. So the parts not taken are something that, you know, are in yes. the treasure chest that belongs to the historian because many, because, you know, collectively as humanity, we, we have chosen to forget. And um, it's, it's, you know, and, and, and that's, that's the reason why, I mean, I would urge you, for example, to, you know, to, to maybe write, write and, and say something about, you know, what, what are our alternatives what are the alternative narratives available to us now, given that we've understood, you know, historically what has happened, right? And I think I'd, I'd love to see something like that come from, uh, come from someone like yourself who has now deeply understood it across borders too, right? Like, so it's not, it's not about food security in a location, but it's actually about how mm -hmm. research people, ideas travel across. Uh, so I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be with us this evening and to, to our audiences for taking the time to be with us and asking what I think were, were wonderful questions. I enjoyed, I enjoyed you know, bringing them to you, Gabriella, and I, I, I trust you might have enjoyed answering them too. Um, it's, uh, please do leave us your feedback, everybody. Um, I'd, I'd like to end the evening by asking you just one question, Gabriella. Can you give us the names of a couple of agronomists who work with who worked with Pandram Khan Koji? And I'll tell you why, because it's absolutely delightful to see that you know, uh, as a person as a person you know of Mexican origin and of course having travelled and worked the world over and now sitting you know at Harvard and Princeton. Well, this particular year in Princeton, um, you know, you you <laughs> have you found your way to Khan Koji. I think it would be beautiful if someone working on the agronomy and history of agriculture in India were to find their way to Mexico or to, you know, Ghana or to, you know, somewhere else, yeah. right? And I think it would be great to find these stories, to learn, to juxtapose, to contrast. So could you tell us the names of, of a few of them and we'll, we'll share them with our viewers so that, you know, it hopefully leads to more curiosity about Mexico. Absolutely. So the first one who comes to mind is Edmundo Tabuada. And I can send you the writing, um, but Edmundo Tabuada is is like when you think about it, agronomists are fascinating individuals. And a Tabuada, um, correct, a Tabu O A D A, and Tabuada. T -A okay. yes, uh, Edmundo Tabuada um, in is one of the leading geneticists when it comes to plant geneticists in Mexico at this time. But he also he studies in the United States and travels to the US and Canada. And he comes back and he realizes how important experimental stations are. So he um, eventually works his way up and becomes director of experimental stations in Mexico. And he himself had a really interesting understanding of the role that land tenure had worked with in Mexico. So he tries, he, many of the broken up estates some of that land becomes part of, becomes experimental stations. But there's also Marte Gomez, uh, Marte like Mars. And, um, and Marte Gomez comes from a completely different microclimate in Mexico. This is the tropical area of Mexico. And he becomes, eventually works his way up to become the Minister of Agriculture. And Marte Gomez becomes friends with Cancoche. Very, mm -hmm. And he employ, he's the one who offers him employment. So, uh, and Marte Gomez, curiously enough, is one of the founders of the Bank for Farmers. So there's a little bit of complications which gets, which gets back to um, Emilia's question, because you, why is one of these proponents for farming suddenly on the board of bankers um, as an agronomist himself? Um, I'm, I'm trying to think who else would have been a contemporary uh, other names fail me at the moment, but I can send them to you because there are literally dozens uh, at, at this moment. I can imagine. But I, I would be happy to send them to you and then we can, uh, you can hopefully send them on to, to folks. 
Absolutely, we'll do that, and we'll 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 list them up. Uh, you know where where we um, uh, have your um, have your talk next to Khan Koje, the exhibit on Khan Koje, uh, produced by Savitri Soni. You know, as soon as I hang up, there's 15 that are going to come out of my mouth because <laughs> of my apologies. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gabriela. It was a it was an absolute pleasure to have you speak to us and um, also give us the time to pick your brains on the many questions that we had. Thank you again to the audience to uh, have taken the time to spend with us on a Saturday evening, and we look forward to the next full week of Phytopia and fun with plants. And to Gabriela, thanks again. Good night. Thank you so much. <laughs>